I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed and on the pedestal these words appear my name is ozymandias king of kings look on my works ye mighty and despair nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck boundless and bare the lone and level sand stretch far away Welcome everybody to the final Breaking Bad review. We have made it all the way to season five, the fifth and final season of Breaking Bad, the end of the story of Walter White, and the end of my favorite television show of all time. Also, the greatest final season of any show that I have watched through to its entirety. Now for those of us that actually watched this season live on television, it was actually shown in two parts, one probably I think eight episodes one year, and then the following year was the remaining eight episodes, yeah eight episodes, it was 16 episodes long. So in a way I still view this season as two separate seasons, and the first half definitely is its own kind of its own story and then the second half is basically all of the payoff for that so it fits together nice as a, as a whole season but it's still hard to think of it as a fifth season whenever I always view it as five and six but nonetheless not only for time's sake but because most of you out there who are watching this is probably seeing this show for the first time leading up to El Camino and you only know this as season five since that's what they've released it as on Netflix and everything else so season five of Breaking Bad I'm going to be talking about the first half for the first half of this review and then I'll transition into the back half because there's way too much to discuss to do it all at once. And the first half of this season really is about Walt rising to be the king, if you will. Uh, Gus is out of the way. There's no product being moved whatsoever in his territory in the Albuquerque area and the surrounding states of, um, around New Mexico. And it's about him coming away from this victory against Gustavo Fring and going full on Scarface, like full on drug cartel kingpin. And basically, it, from the very first episode of this season, Walt is very different. Like Walt, the, the true evil in Walt comes out in this season. And this is the season, if you have not lost sympathy for Walter White yet, this is the one that will do it because he is full on the villain of the show in season five. You still are infatuated with his story. Certainly by the time you get to the second half of the season, there's elements of him that you do have redeeming factors for and you do want to see him succeed for those redeeming factors. But Walter White is the full on villain of Breaking Bad by this point. And you'll even see it in subtle ways where like the there's a scene whenever Walt and Jesse are in this, um, they're driving away from this job that they just did and Walter White's in the back and they say something and he basically has a response along the lines of because I said so. And it's like he has this cockiness now that I'm the Gus, I'm the king, I am the one that everybody answers to and nobody is going to do anything about it. Um, even the scene with that, that was in a lot of the trailers leading up to season five's release with him and Saul Goodman where he walks up to him and says, we're done when I say we're done and just totally gets into his face. Like he's just full on bad guy at this point and a lot of it comes from the aftermath of season four it starts and you have not only the aftermath of everybody freaking out over gustavo fring being revealed to be tied to the cartel somehow um, as well as this company electro magical electromotive but you also have like the fallout with skylar where whenever he takes the phone call at the end of the season and says i won and she realizes that he's the one that just blew up the nursing home she changes almost instantly because in season four they were definitely kind of starting to connect more 
and that villain that is Walter White is kind of truly revealed to her in the beginning of this season. She spends the rest of the season trying to get away from it, trying to survive it, trying to withstand it, trying to get her kids away from it until his cancer comes back and he dies, basically. Uh, there's even a really gripping scene between them where they're arguing and she pretty much tells him, I'm waiting for you to die. And <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a powerful scene because it's the first time she's truly said something that that dark to him. And to a certain degree, you totally sympathize with her and to a certain degree, you look at it from Walt's perspective and you're like, wow, that was a bitch thing to say. Um, but again, this, that, that complication of Skylar's character is, is throughout this season as well. But getting back to Walt, this is where now, the show is kind of coming full circle in season five. One of the biggest elements that I loved about season one is that Walt always had these scientific solutions to these problems that they had, like with the ricin, um, with the thermite, with the whole dissolving the bodies and acid, everything like that. You get to this season, and this is the first season that they kind of come back to that to a certain degree, where now you have Mike and Jesse and Walt teaming up and they come up with these solutions, mostly Jesse actually, which is pretty cool. I'll get into Jesse. But uh, they come up with these scientific solutions to these problems where they have this laptop with all this information on it and they have a giant ass magnet to suck the laptop into the wall and, and destroy it. Um, then you even get the thing with the, the methylamine train, which is probably the best episode or, well, there's a lot of really good episodes. Either that or Say My Name for the first half. That's my favorite, so I'll get into that later as well. But the um, Dead Freight episode where they have to steal this methylamine and they come up with this solution to basically steal it while it's in transit uh, and not let anybody know that it's even been stolen, which is a very kind of scientific thing where they're trying to replace it with water in the same amounts. Very cool episode, but love the fact that that element comes back to it. And moving on to Jesse, Jesse is in a place where He's kind of content with where they're at. Like he doesn't really necessarily distrust Walt um, until the, the the middle of the season, really. But he's cool with where they are. The fact that they have reigned victorious over Gus. Um, the fact that he's kind of got Mike somewhat on their side a little bit makes him feel a lot better. But Jesse's a lot more content this season with, you know, not really being kingpin you know what I mean there's times whenever like they're dividing up the money and he's like look just take it out of my share I don't even, I don't even care um, and I love the fact that he's the one that comes up with these scientific solutions like where you have Mike and you have Walt kind of having this old man argument a couple of times and Jesse's like hey what about a magnet hey guys what about a magnet yo what about a magnet bitch and um, it, it's cool to see that Jesse has grown that much as a character that now as I've said come coming full circle they have these issues that they need to resolve and instead of Walt coming up with these solutions just out of thin air, it's Jesse who has learned so much and now he's the one coming up with the solutions and kind of thinking outside of the box. Also really like how he kind of, his relationship with Walt kind of grows back to where they're very strong partners again, to where you know he, he gives him a watch for his birthday. There's even a great scene whenever he comes over to uh, talk with Walt and Walt invites him to stay because things are so tense between him and Skylar, he just doesn't give a fuck anymore. And this, this dinner scene happens, which is one of the best scenes as far as like comedy in the entire season, where it's the first time that Jesse's actually got to interact with Skylar and isn't some dirty little secret, but they're sitting there eating and Walt and Skylar, the tension is just pliable in the air. And you know, they're, they're just saying really shitty things back to each other. And he just keeps drinking his water and kind of like looking back and forth at him. <laughs> it's a great little, it's a great thing to see in the final season that they finally have Jesse sit down with the family and it's in that vein. It's great. Mike, very big player in the first half of this season. Uh, coming off of the death of Gus, he's pissed off, he's angry. Uh, the feds have basically seized all the money that he's been saving for years for his granddaughter and now he has to work with Walt and work with Jesse to gain that nest egg back. And what's great about Mike in the first half of this season is that he is a total badass yet again. When you have Lydia trying to take him out and he has all of his ex, you know, partners or all of his ex-comrades trying to take him out, all these other hitmen, and he's just outsmarting all of them and taking them all out. I'm really sorry about this, Mike, but I needed the money. Those feds, they, they took it all, man. I know. Are you ready? This is Mike. <laughs> 
Um, that is badass. And then not only that, the interactions that he has with Walt. He's the one person that will not take any of Walter White's shit. As soon as he starts to talk like he's the man, Mike just brings him down about eight pegs. Like, listen, bitch, this is how it's gonna go from now on, so you best get yourself right with it. And that is great. Like, the fact that they always have that that cool kind of partnership where they can, they can feel like they have some chemistry there, but there's always that budding head, that kind of old man, budding head dynamic between these two characters. And that's one of those things that I just love about Mike. He's just this very calm, collected badass. And that's really prominent in the first half of season five, all the way up to the point when he is murdered by Walter White, which is at the very latest, that is the moment that you can no longer sympathize with Walter White. If you're okay with any of the shit that he's done up till now, letting Jane die, um, you know, letting Gail die, really ordering the hit on Gail, blowing up the nursing home, poisoning Brock. If you can get past that and still have some sympathy for Walter White, the moment that he pulls that gun out and shoots Mike in cold blood over really just a, a moment of testing his little ego and, and poking and prodding at his pride, then you're no longer on Walter White's side. Like I said, you're still on board for the story. You still want to see it follow through the, to the end, and they definitely bring some of that back by the end of the second half of the season, but... That is the moment when you're like, okay, Walt, fuck you. <laughs> you killed Mike, you son of a bitch. But that episode, Say My Name, like I said, it's that or Dead Freight that's my favorite episode of the first half of this season. And, and Say My Name, Dead Freight is awesome because of the action of it and the train and the introduction of, or the reintroduction of Bill Burr and that kind of shocking scene at the end with the kid, um, which talking about Jesse, that's, one, that's the moment whenever he's just full on out in this season when that kid gets killed and they have to you know disincorporate his body and get rid of the evidence and act like nothing happened that's when he's out he's like i'm done with with walter white when he hears walter whistle and he knows that he's not affected by this at all but jesse's just taking it so hard throwing money out the window doesn't want anything to do with it that's when he truly turns as a character in the second half leading to what eventually happens in in, in or in the first half leading to eventually what happens in the second half but Say My Name, overall, whenever you have Walt and Mike just completely at odds with each other, Mike wants to sell off the methylamine and be done with the business, Walt wants to cook it, Walt steals it and gets away and basically comes up with this plot that I'm going to go talk to these other dealers and I'm going to make them sell my product. You get this awesome scene whenever he's telling them, like, you know who I am. Say My Name. Say My Name. Eisenberg. You're goddamn right. And they're acting like they don't know him. And he's like, say my name, bitch. You know you can fucking say my name. You're Heisenberg. You're goddamn right. Awesome shit. And by this point, you still don't, you, you don't hate Walt just yet. Because he hasn't killed Mike yet. But that scene, at the beginning of that episode, you're like, fuck you, Walt. You're goddamn Heisenberg. The whole thing with Mike finally being on the run, that whole heartbreaking scene when he's sitting in the park with his granddaughter, he gets the tip from Walt that the feds are onto him, that they know where he is, he sees the police cars coming up and he kind of like nudges forward to get his granddaughter and then he looks around and realizes that he can't get to her without them seeing him and just has to leave. Leading up to that ultimate confrontation where he gets tired of Walter White's shit and lets him have it and says everything that he's been wanting to say to him and everything that a lot of audience members have been wanting to say to Walt where they're like, he just flat out just freaks on him. He's like, you know what? You fucked everything up. This is all your fault. You couldn't just let good enough be good enough. You had to be the man. You had to, you had to weasel your way into this situation and take out Fring. We were all safe. We were all secure, all for your fucking pride. And then just walks away like, fuck you, bitch. I'll see you in the next life. And Walt just cannot take it. And it's, it, it's haunting the way that it happens where he just walks up and shoots him and then Mike drives off and he's gone for a second, finds him in the bushes and Walt starts talking that shit again. And he's like, I'm sorry, you know, I just realized that, you know, I, I realized that Lydia has the information. This didn't need to happen. I'm sorry, Mike. And he just goes, shut the fuck up and let me die. God damn, Mike's a badass. Oh, such a great swan song for that character in that, in that episode, Say My Name. Um, one of the better send-offs for a very important side character for a series that I've ever seen. You get into Hank, and Hank in this first half, he's the man of the DEA now. You know, the fact that he was 
right about freeing, he becomes the ASAC of his little region of the DEA in Albuquerque. So he's the one making the shot or calling the shots, making the calls. Um, he's he's kind of struggling with his job a little bit, but he's still trying to figure out, so trying to connect the dots with the Gus Fring thing to where, you know, he's trying to look at pictures of this lab that they nuked at the end of the fourth season. He's trying to look into this magical electromotive. He's trying to figure out where all of these pieces of the puzzle are. While not really getting a whole lot closer to Walt necessarily, he keeps getting a little bit closer, but Walt and Mike and Jesse and Lydia are always a couple of steps ahead of Hank. And like there's a part where they figure out that there's a little tracker underneath the barrel of methylamine and then Walt has to go in and plant the tracker in his office. And Walt really toys with Hank the most in this first half of the season, trying to keep him at bay and um, really has the most control over what Hank knows in the first half of this season. So he's kind of, a lot of his storyline is saved for the second half. The first half is more so just his rise and rank in the DEA and just getting this incrementally closer to putting together the whole puzzle. And then you have new characters. You have Lydia, who's kind of like the, the, the suit that um, Gustavo Fring was in contact with with this company, Magical Electromotive. And she's a really great character because you never really know where this bitch stands. And I say that because her character is like full on biatch. You walk in and immediately she tries to kill Mike and you're like, okay, I don't like you. And then she like, like I said, every single thing that she tries to do that seems like maybe she's trying to help these guys, the way that she says it, there's no trust whatsoever in the way that this chick's cadence comes across. Like everything that she says, you just want to, with a little grain of salt, call bullshit. Um, and, and there's even a great episode where they get to the point where Mike's going to take her out and they're calling, he's calling bullshit on her. Walt and Jesse are like, oh, let's get down to the bottom of this. And she comes this close to getting her head blown off because she's just so distrustful. But she's a really interesting character because she's kind of like that corporate head. Like that's, that's Walt kind of cutting through the middleman that was Gus Fring and getting straight to the source of this company. So she has a nice little interesting dynamic with him too. And uh, there's quite a few times whenever she comes about this close to death with Walt and with Mike. And then you have Todd. Todd seemed like he was not gonna be very significant whenever this character first kind of gets introduced into this season. They come up with this plot, which again is like scientific solutions that I love. I love that element, that callback in season five where they're trying to figure out where they're gonna cook. They don't have their super lab anymore. And there's this episode where they're trying to come up with all these ideas with Saul Goodman on places where they can cook and it be undetected. And they come up with the solution of getting in cahoots with this company, Vamanos Pest, that puts the tents over houses and bug bombs them for you know overnight. And they're gonna go in and basically set their lab up each and every single time that they're gonna cook and they have like guitar cases and everything. They put all this equipment in. They're gonna set up the lab, cook a batch, take everything down, and then bug bomb the place because nobody's ever gonna be suspicious of fog or weird smells coming out of these tents, which is a brilliant concept. But Vamanos Pest is kind of a criminal front for Todd and his uncle to where they bug bomb the place, but they also rob shit. So he kind of is, is very, slowly introduced into the gang, if you will, to where he kind of just takes interest and kind of seems a little bit more interested in what's going on with this meth cooking thing and is a little bit more respectful towards Walter White, almost like he's this authority figure. And then it all kind of comes to a very ugly head in Dead Freight where they enlist his help to help them rob this train in a very badass sequence. where the show, again, foreshadowing, begins this episode with a kid on a motorbike where he picks up a tarantula and you hear a train and he drives off and you totally forget about that. By the end of the episode, they're victorious, they rob this train, everything's going great, they're high-fiving, they're cheering, and they look over and this kid on the motorbike is just sitting there. Jesse's reaction to this is great, but also it's just, 
it shows you how cold and how like lack of, of, of empathy, sympathy that this character has, like a total psychopath that Todd is. And in that moment, you're like, whoa, where is this character going? And he kind of comes out of nowhere with that angle. And from then on, there's this huge rivalry and this huge antagonistic relationship between him and Jesse. And you're totally on Jesse's side, obviously. And then there's kind of like this mentor-apprentice replacement relationship going on between him and Walt to where the further that Jesse tries to withdraw himself, the more that Walt kind of embraces Todd as his new apprentice. And it just sets things up in a very interesting way for where they pay it off in the second half of the season. All leading up to the quite literal oh shit moment to where Walt's ego ultimately gets the best of him and ultimately leads to his downfall to where this Leaves of Grass book, this Walt Whitman poetry collection that uh, Gail Bedecker gave to him and signed to dub my other favorite WW, you know, best regards, Gail Bedecker, or whatever it says, or GB. And at the end of this half of the season, Hank is just going to the bathroom. You don't really know what's going on. He's looking for something to read picks up this uh, Leaves of Grass book, calls back to the scene in season four whenever he's asking Walter White about uh, who this WW that uh, Gail Bedecker's notes might be referring to. And he says, yeah, you got me. And then the look on Hank's face where he's like, slowly starts putting it together on the shitter like, oh fuck, he's been under my nose the whole time. Now for those of us that watched it live on TV, you had a year to wait before you saw what happened or damn near a year, nine, 10 months, that was, painful trying to wait like oh my god where is the last half of this season gonna go lucky for all you guys you can just watch it on netflix right now just go right to the next episode but um that was a great wrap up to this season initially when i saw it live i wasn't sure how i felt about it it seemed a little too easy upon rewatch and especially after you get to experience the second half of the season and kind of view it as a whole it is perfect because there's a scene early on in the season where Walt is looking through all his books and he sees it and he looks at it and he knows exactly what it is. He knows exactly what information is inside of it and he knows exactly how incriminating this book would be in the wrong hands. He looks at it, he smirks, and he sets it down right in the public eye to be out for anybody to look at. And it goes along with how confident and cocky and full on evil that this guy becomes instantly when season five starts to where he feels like he's the man now. And his ego, which is the one kind of recurring theme that keeps fucking him up throughout this entire series, and his pride is the ultimate thing that will bite him in the ass in the end, and that's exactly what happens just with simply leaving a book out. Now I will say the first half of this season, especially when you view it as its own thing and when you watched it live or you only had these eight episodes and you had to wait a, the better part of a year to get the second half of it, there's elements of this first half that does feel slightly rushed, and I mean slightly as in as slight as you can take that word. And it's more so with how cocky and how evil Walt is from the gate. It's almost jarring. I feel like it's necessary, and when I rewatch it and you watch the show in, in, in succession, and you go immediately from season four, the only part that's a little jarring for me is just the way that he is where he's about to be, he feels like he's about to be killed by Gus whenever you get to the episode Crawl Space and he's trying so hard to get his brother-in-law safe and get his family safe and accept his fate. He tells Skylar, you know, the, the consequences of my actions are coming. And then immediately once he kills Gus, like within a day or so, uh, at least for what you can assume the timeline of the show is, within a day, within a, a week at most, he's full on evil, don't give a fuck, I've won and you are all at my mercy now. which is necessary to get you off of his side because Walter White, this is the story of him becoming the villain. This is about, you know, they pitched it as Mr. Chips becoming Scarface. And at some point, Scarface needs to be somebody that you can no longer sympathize with. It just feels slightly abrasive and slightly jarring whenever you get into it. And immediately, he's just that unlikable as a character. Which then again, maybe he was unlikable all along, but we're just so infatuated with his storyline that it takes him being full on unapologetic about it for you to truly see who this guy is and then suddenly sympathize with characters like Skyler or Walter Jr. or even Hank to a certain degree that you kind of want to be kept at bay and let Walter White do his thing and now you're like, oh fuck, this guy's a dick. And now moving into the second half, the real, for me, the final season of Breaking Bad and holy shit, 
you want to talk about eight episodes that are just absolutely incredible. Not a week wasted or slow moment between them. You start off, picks up right where it left off, Hank walking out of this bathroom, not really truly understanding or believing what he just found and spends the rest of the episode trying to put pieces together, getting all the case files from the blue meth business and Tuco and the, the twins and Hector Salamanca and Gus and everything brought to his house and he's trying to put all these pieces together and figure out where Walt could be in all of this and how this person actually could be Heisenberg. And it feels like this is something that might be drawn out for a while. This might be three, four, five, six episodes of him trying to piece it all together before ultimately confronting Walt. Nope confronts him by the end of the episode. Walt finds the little bug underneath his car and that's a true oh shit moment for the audience where you're like, oh man, like he finds it and just looks around and you feel his heartbeat start to go a little bit more. Um, goes to confront Hank in his own garage and just kind of like doing that Walter White thing where he's subtly talking to him and you know, dropping hints out there, trying to figure out what he wants, trying to be sly and then eventually just says fuck it and he says, hey, What's up with this bug underneath my car? You know anything about this? And I love Hank's reaction where he looks at him and he just grabs the, the garage door opener and just goes, click. You gotta say, I don't like the way you're looking at me right now. As a viewer, you're sitting there the whole time like, oh, fuck, this is just the first episode. Oh, man, such a great start to this second half and really just sets the pace for where things are going to go for the rest of the final season to where Hank full on knows what is he going to do with this information? Is he going to try to get Skyler and the kids out? Um, is he going to go after Walt? Who's going to believe him? How much does he need to present to get people on his side about it? What is Walt ultimately going to do now that this person who he considers family, who he's tried numerous times to protect, and keep alive is now the ultimate threat to him. How is he gonna to respond to that? How is Skylar gonna to respond to that? There's so many questions that you have in your head at the end of this episode, and every single one of them goes in a crazy route that you probably did not expect through the next seven episodes. Skylar gets confronted by Hank. Hank basically is trying to tell her, you need to just, you need to come with me. You need to bring the kids over. We gotta take this guy down. She panics, freaks the fuck out, thinks that she's gonna be culpable in all this leaves, ends up begrudgingly having to stand by Walt and try to basically fuck over Hank and Marie and try to keep them away from being able to incriminate Walt, which just puts her in a really interesting position from where she was in the first half of this season where she's basically one of the dudes dead and now she has to partner with him to fuck over her own family to keep herself safe because of her own paranoia and because of how much she's been involved in this from season three to season four to now with all the money laundering and, and how much she actually truly has known about all of this and not said anything. Then you get to Jesse, and Jesse is the one, like, like there's so many scenes that you look at with Jesse and Aaron Paul's performance, and you're like, that won him the Emmy right there. Nope, that won him the Emmy. Nope, that won him the Emmy. You could argue and say that this is the greatest acting that Aaron Paul has ever done in his career, which I'll see El Camino tonight and see if maybe he tops that, but as far as Breaking Bad, this might be the best that Aaron Paul has ever been as Jesse in this back half of the fifth season. So much emotion comes out whenever you get to the point when he puts two and two together and realizes almost a minute too late whenever he's finally like, He's at a point where Walt has manipulated him for the last time to try to get him out of Albuquerque because he knows that Hank's eventually gonna to come to him and eventually going to try to get to Walt through him. And that father-son dynamic hits one final time whenever he's basically manipulating him into starting a new life, using this contact that Saul Goodman has to go and get a new identity. And he does it because he cares about Walt that much. I mean, you need me gone, because your dickhead brother-in-law is never going to let up. Just say so. Just ask me for a favor. Just tell me you don't give a shit about me, and it's either this, it's either this, or you'll kill me the same way you killed Mike. 
But right at the last possible second, he puts all the pieces together. He goes for his cigarette. He thinks back on all the things that have happened regarding that rice and cigarette. He realizes that Huel has pickpocketed him and he starts to put all these things together and he looks at this ride that's gonna take him to salvation and he looks down and he looks back and he looks down and he chooses, fuck Walter White, I'm getting this motherfucker back now. The scene that plays out when he storms into Saul Goodman's office and demands information and just freaking out on him. The rice and cigarettes! You had him still off of me! And all for that asshole, Mr. White! He poisoned Brock! He poisoned Brock and you! You helped him! Okay, Jesse, calm down. Say it again! Tell me one more time to calm down, come on! I'm sorry! Yes, okay, I had you will lift your cigarette, but what made me? Might be the best scene from Jesse in this entire season. Like, again, there's, there's many of them. That might be the one where you're like, damn, Aaron Paul can act his ass off. And from this point forward, that relationship between Walt and Jesse, broken forever. Gone. He is totally against Walt. Walt is the enemy, and he's going to take him down at any cost going to try to burn his house at one point, eventually teaming up with Hank, which is one of the best dynamics of this season whenever Hank finally embraces Jesse, which is a great turnaround from where they were in season three whenever he was chasing him, ends up beating the shit out of him, and Jesse's got him by the balls. So put it out. You can't keep getting away with it! He can't keep getting away with it! The fact that they team up to take down Hank, or to take down Walt, and the scene whenever he's confessing everything that they've done into the camera and giving all these details, and starts working with him and Steve Gomez and you know manipulating Walt and going out to that public little forum whenever he's sitting down on a bench and he feels like he's gonna try to assassinate him in some weird way, which is just a really tense scene. And the scary part about it is how dark Hank goes in this back half of the season in regards to Jesse and just so desperate, so determined to get Walter White that he will do things that normally this character would never do, like put Jesse in harm's way and be pretty damn sure he's gonna get killed but won't really care because if he does, then that's just one more thing he can tack on to Walter White. So you see Hank go to some dark places in this second half and, and there's points in it where you almost are afraid of how far he is going to go. You understand it, you see how much he's been trying to get Heisenberg for five seasons now and then to find out that it's this person underneath his nose fucking him over all along. You understand that burning hatred and that, that desire, the same desire that Jesse has to get Walter White but it takes him to some very interesting places. And then ultimately after everything is said and done which actually I don't even need to get into that yet. We have to talk about Ozymandias. When everything comes to fruition, whenever everything has come to a head, whenever Walter White has done everything he can to resolve this situation with Hank, whenever he, he's tried to do everything he can to resolve the situation with Jesse, whenever you have his involvement with these neo-Nazis, Todd's uncle and his gang, whenever you have Hank and Jesse coming to their last couple of plans to try to get Walt at any cost, it all comes to a head, first at the end of Dahajali, where they con Walt into thinking that they have his money, they found where he has buried it, and they're burning it, and he freaks the fuck out and goes out there and leads them right to it. That is a great scene, and because you finally get to see Hank be victorious, where Hank gets to arrest Walt, Walt is down, Walt is caught, Walt is defeated, he calls off the neo-Nazis, tells them not to come, accepts his fate, Hank is victorious, he gets one last phone call into Marie where he tells him that I finally got him. Or he tells her that I finally got him. The, the, the feeling of victory in her voice, the feeling of victory in his voice, like I'm gonna be tied up with this for a while but I'll be home tonight, I love you. And then you just start to see these trucks come in. And you're like, oh no. And it's Todd's uncle and his gang of neo-Nazis coming through to see what the fuck was going on this big ass shootout starts between them and Hank and Steve Gomez while Walt is locked in a truck while he's screaming at him, no, no, don't do it, leave. And this episode almost gave me a damn heart attack because this whole thing pops off, bullets are flying, 
There's tons of different camera angles. You don't know if anybody's getting shot. You're just seeing all these angles, all these bullets, all these guns going through. Walt scrambling around and then whoosh, the episode cuts to black. And you can even ask my dad. I was watching this with him and we're watching it and this whole thing's popping up and I'm like, I'm sitting forward, I'm not blinking, we're watching the TV, my fucking heart is stopped, and then it goes, and then it cuts to black, and I was like, huh? and then it says created by Vince Gilligan, and I was like, fuck! Just, this is one of those seasons, just like season four was, this back half of this season was so, you had so much anxiety to the point where an episode ended and you can barely stand to wait a week to figure out what happened. But you wait that week, and you get to Ozymandias, which for all intents and purposes is the finale of Breaking Bad. There's two more episodes, you got Granite State and then you have Felina, but that is much more kind of epilogue to the overall story. Still awesome episodes too, like Felina uh, is probably in my top 10. But you get to Ozymandias, and this is most people's favorite episode of this show. It's not quite mine, it's definitely one of the best, but um, there, there's episodes that I enjoy more. But Ozymandias is where everything in this show comes to a head. Everything comes to its eventual conclusion for the most part where episode opens, Steve Gomez is gone. Bye, Gomi. Uh, Hank is wounded. He's down on the ground. Walt freaking out left and right, begging for his life, trying to give up anything he can. And even at this point, even though that he's been antagonistic with Hank for the past you know, five episodes, and he comes to the point where he offers all of his money. Like, you can have all, I think it was $88 million buried right over there, just walk away. Wants so desperately to save his brother-in-law's life, to no avail. Hank gets shot, and you're like, that's the one, that's the moment where as much carnage that they have left in their wake, that is the moment when you really feel the weight of what Walter White has done. And that's the moment when he feels the weight of what he's done, where he falls onto the ground and just collapses into tears looking at his brother-in-law's corpse. And then you have the whole thing with Jesse. Uh, another big kind of sad payoff with that where Walt offers him up to the neo-Nazis, points him out and says, I want him dead. But before they take him away, walks up to him and just says, I watched Jane die. Like that one little piece of information that you've wondered for numerous seasons now, when is that truth gonna come out? Because I always figured that was the one, that was gonna be the tipping point, that eventually somehow Jesse was gonna find that out and that was what was gonna be, that caused the big rift that would eventually play out in a final season. But you get it in this very sad and quiet moment where Walter is basically condemning him to death. But before you die, I just want you to realize how fucked up I truly am and how much I really have fucked with your life. And he says it in like this victorious way and just walks away and Jesse just kind of almost doesn't even have a reaction to it. He's just like, oh my God, of course, one more thing on top of the plethora of things that I've found out. Of course, that one thing that totally erupted my life was you. Whew, deep shit. And then eventually Jesse gets, <laughs> You think he's gonna die, or you think that they're gonna—they're basically going to be condemning him to death. They watch the videotape uh, where he's confessing all this stuff. They go out to try to assassinate him, but they keep him around basically as a meth slave, which is a fate that's almost worse than death. Where he exists in a little cage, demeaning little hole in the ground out on their little neo-Nazi property, just to be hooked to a little dog chain and cook meth for the entirety of his life, however much life they give him. And it's just, you see Jesse in this spot and you're just like, oh my God, as many dark places as this character has been, this might be the worst. And it just leaves you in a spot where you're like, my God, please let Jesse get out of this. You feel for the character. I mean, Jesse's always kind of been the heart of the show and certainly the more that Walt gets evil, the more that you really start to latch onto Jesse as kind of like the light. And when you see it in the biggest pit of darkness, it just breaks your heart. It breaks your heart as an audience member and it breaks your heart as a fan of the character. And it, it makes you hate Walt all that much more by the point that he is, is at in this, this season. Then the ultimate confrontation comes. When he comes home, Skyler has already been notified by Marie that he's in handcuffs, that Hank has won, Hank has got him. 
and she makes him conf she makes her sister confess everything to Walter Jr. He won't believe anything. They rush home thinking that they're going to talk it out, and Walt is frantically there, alive, not in handcuffs, trying to you know pack everything in a frantic panic. And she puts two and two together and realizes. She thinks that he killed Hank, but she puts two and two together and realizes that Hank is dead. And that's why he's here. And that's the moment when Skylar's had enough. Pulls the knife on him, you have this huge confrontation with those two characters where you're like, again, you're on the edge of your seat, like, oh my God, is somebody gonna get stabbed? Is somebody gonna die? Walter Jr. comes into it, and finally stands up to his dad, totally takes his mom's side. And in that moment, he loses everything. He loses his family, he loses everything that he is supposedly, at least according to his logic, has fought this hard to protect and to, to secure, loses it all. All kind of culminating in probably one of the most heart-wrenching, especially as a father, one of the most heart-wrenching sequences in this entire series. And maybe the most heart-wrenching thing in the entire episode for as many dark things happen. When he basically kidnaps his infant daughter, Drives away, later on realizes what he has to do, and he calls Skylar and starts basically threatening her, knowing that the police are listening in, and it feels genuine, and then you realize that he's basically giving her an out. He's, he's incriminating himself and making her this blameless victim by, you know, I, I threatened you for a solid year, I told you not to cross me, Hank crossed me, now he's dead, just starts giving all these details to make Skylar this victim and make Walter White this ultimate evil and just accepting his fate that everybody is going to know that I'm Heisenberg now so I might as well own it and be the worst Heisenberg that I can be. The performance by Brian Cranston in that scene is another one of those moments where you just realize how incredible of an actor this guy is. Whenever he's delivering this hate-filled message but you see the pain in his eyes and tears are running down his face as he's basically signing his family away for the rest of his life. and then has to leave his infant daughter in a fire truck knowing that she'll be you know, taken back to, to, to Skylar. He kind of holds her for one last moment and it, it's, I'm almost getting choked up talking about it now, it, it's gut-wrenching as a father to think about that, to, to hold your child one last time knowing that you're never gonna see them again and that the basically the, they're out of your life forever from this moment forward and walking away from them. Um, <laughs> That and then he, he drives away with, with Robert Forster going to his new identity and basically leaving all of the weight that he has caused um, behind him. And you, you could almost, you could almost end the series there and it would be a downer somewhat, but it would be a fitting end to a lot of the storylines of this show. But you get into the last two episodes, you get into Granite State which is mostly an episode focused on what Walter's life is now, whenever he has to, to, to live in hiding, whenever Robert Forster gives him this new identity, he has to live in this little shack out in know, like Colorado or something like that. It's, a, it's snow everywhere, it's cold as shit. He's got this fucked up little cottage where he's got like this bullshit stove that he can kind of cook on. He's got a TV that the motherfucker brought him, Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium, that's all he can watch. Um, and you basically just see Walt in this state where life is just quickly leaving him. His cancer is back, like I forgot to mention that, that's also something that gets introduced back in this season where his cancer kind of comes back and he's fighting that alongside everything else, but his cancer is slowly eating away at him even more. He's becoming more decrepit, he's losing weight, you know, he's got a full on beard and a, and a shitty nappy haircut. And you just realize that this guy is basically just sitting in the pit of hell at this point. Like knowing that everything that he has fought for has gone to shit. His family is disgraced. Um, his family is, is, God knows what's going on with them. He has Robert Forrester check in on him from time to time and finds out that they're you know, living in an apartment. And she's working some bullshit job at a cab company and all this stuff to where he feels all of the wake that he has brought with his decisions slowly over months in this episode. And one of my favorite parts of it is that eventually he gets to the point where he's done. He wants to get money to his son because in his eyes and his weird logic and his pride, it can't all be for nothing. I have to at least get this money to my son so that I can feel like it was worth it to some extent calls Walter Jr. in secret and Walter Jr. doesn't have any of it and just gives it to him. Why aren't you dead? Like a really heartbreaking thing for a father to hear but he already heard it from Skylar and just you truly feel 
the the weight of what Walter Jr. has just dealt with the past couple of months and, and now that he's disgraced and his, his life has gone to shit because of his father and you just feel all that hate come out in that scene and I love the fact that he's down to the point where he's done. He's going to turn himself in, calls in, tells the, you know, gives an anonymous tip and leaves the phone dangling for the cops to come and take him because there's nothing left. There's no reason to live anymore. There's no reason to hide anymore. Maybe I can just turn myself in and get my family out, I believe is pretty much what he, his, his mental state is. But that ego, the cancer can't eat that baby, sitting there at the bar, having a little drink, watching the TV, <laughs> the motherfucking Gretchen and Elliot, come on. Gray Matter, once again, which is an element that in the first half of the season, if you weren't quite latching onto the details before, it pretty much solidifies it that gray matter is the ultimate thing that causes a lot of his ego, a lot of his pride, and a lot of his stubbornness towards all the decisions that he's made in the show. To where he tells Jesse, when Jesse's asking him, are we in the meth business or are we in the money business? Like, how much is enough? And he tells him the story of gray matter, where I started this company with my college roommate. We had all these patents, all these things that we were gonna do. The, the potential was great and I gave it all up. I sold it for a couple of thousand dollars. Now that company is worth billions. And it's that mistake that he made early on, which they never completely tell you why, which is another thing that I love about it. They leave just enough ambiguous to where you can put two and two together or come up with your own version, which I always love that version of storytelling more to to certain extent. But you figure, at least I always figured, which they I think they kind of confirmed it to a certain degree since then, but with this conversation that he had with Gretchen Schwartz in the second season and how their relationship fell out and they were at her parents' house and he's just packing his bags, you get this, at least I got this impression that he was always, had this inferiority complex around her whenever he realized that she came from wealth. Like he loved her and then goes to her parents' house and realizes that she's this you know, rich girl and can't have anything to do with that because that's, he's, he's not, you know, he doesn't come from wealth and this, this inferiority thing that this, this woman has already kind of surpassed him uh, to a certain extent, it was too much for him. So he left her and left the company and then ultimately sees them just keep going to riches and his life just devolves into overqualified high school teacher. So they, they introduce that element back to it. Getting back to Granite State, it comes back one last time when he's ready to give it all up and sees on the TV that they discredit him one last time, saying that his only contribution to this company was the name and his facial expression, like he's watching it and then they say all he contributed was the name and he's just like, like gives that little look and then looks down and you see them wheels turning and you're like, that motherfucker's ego, man. It gets this close to letting everything go but here's that bullshit and he's like, oh no, 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 no. That shit ain't gonna fucking stand before I leave this earth. And it's just, it's one of those moments where as evil as he is, you're like, God, get him, Walt. Then you get into Felina. And my God, what a series finale. Might be the best series finale that I've ever seen. It's in very close competition with The Shield. Everything that you would want out of a series finale comes in this episode. He gets back to whatever extent that he can to Gretchen and Schwartz finally has like this superiority over them or he sneaks into their house, they're scared to death of him. And he, he basically muscles them into saying like all this money here, you're gonna give to my son in a donation. Thinking that, I don't know if his son or the, the feds would put two and two together, but thinking that, you know, that again, that determination, that ego, that this is the only way that I can finally win then you're gonna anonymously give this to my son, convinces them that hitmen are out there. That's a great exchange and a great wrap up between all three of those characters to where you just see Gretchen and Schwartz just cower like he's the devil. And it just, it's awesome. Then you get into the heartbreaking shit where he goes back and finds his family and uh, he, he talks with Skylar. It's a really great shot whenever she's talking on the phone. It's from behind and she's talking to Marie where Marie's warning her that the, the feds think that he's back in town. You gotta be careful if you see him, call us. And then the camera just kind of moves over to the side and you see that Walter is standing there listening to the whole conversation. And the great moment between him and Skylar is when he finally says it. When he gets ready to say that line that he has said numerous times in this series, I need you to understand that everything that I have done, I did because, and she cuts him off. And she's like, shut up. If I have to hear that bullshit one more fucking time, and he goes, I did it for me. 
and the look on her face, like, my God, he finally said it. And you hear it as an audience member, and you're like, he finally admitted it. And he gives the reasons why, and it's the truth, where he says, you know, I was dying, I was good at this, and I felt alive. And that's why I kept doing it. And it's like, God damn, finally you get a little bit of truth out there, Walt. And if the heartbreak of Ozymandias wasn't enough, he gets to see his daughter one last time. Uh, knowing for sure this is the last time that he's going to see her because he's basically planned out his ultimate death by the end of this episode. But just, just to add insult to injury, to add salt to the wound, gets to embrace her one last time, gets to only look at his son from a distance. Uh, and again, like the, whenever you're a father, you see these scenes and you just view them in such a way that it's just so much more heartbreaking. Um, you know, when I first saw it, I wasn't a father, and I see it, I'm like, oh, that's some sad shit. You watch it as a father, you didn't, like, even when I was talking about the, the Ozymandias stuff, I almost got choked up because you just think about what an emotional state you'd have to be in to be able to just look at your, your child from a distance, knowing not, full on that they hate you and they want you dead, and that, that, that's as close as you can get to them, is just watching them walk through a door one last time. Um, gripping shit. Then it all comes to the ultimate confrontation with the neo-nazis and walt and i know i'm doing a lot of recap here guys but this is just this season has so much stuff that i want to discuss that it's, it's almost hard to just review it flat out um, without discussing every little tiny detail so previous to this episode it was in granite state jesse tries to escape and they basically show him what they're willing to do and Todd kills Andrea right in front of him, which again is, is probably alongside the scene whenever he confronts Saul Goodman, the best acting you're going to see out of Aaron Paul this season whenever he just breaks down emotionally in the back seat, watching her get shot in the head because of his actions. So he basically willingly becomes this, this slave now, and it catches you back up to where it's, it's been months. He's got longer hair. He's all scarred up from getting the shit beat out of him over and over again, and he's just making meth. That's his life, sitting in a hole, getting fed whatever he gets fed, and then making meth for them. And you have the ultimate confrontation of anything, everything, the final sequence of the show, whenever Walter White and his plan and the, the, the flash forwards, which is something that I forgot to mention as well, where the first half flash forwards to him at 52, and he's got the beard, he's got the long hair, he's going by a different name, Mr. Lambert, and you as an audience member are going, oh, they're showing us where things are going, and obviously things have gone very wrong because he's sick again, he's not with his family, it's a year later, what does this mean? And he buys this gigantic machine gun and it closes a trunk. Then in the second half of the season, when that starts, you get the second piece to this flash forward whenever he has gone back to his own house, which is now kind of condemned, um, there's this great shot where somebody's got graffitied Heisenberg on the inside of his house on the wall. He goes back into his house to retrieve the, the ricin that he has hidden in his little light socket. Comes out, says hi to his neighbor, and she freaks the fuck out. So again, the flash forwards were, were a really great element this season to let you know that things are going bad at some point. Just to let you know, in case you weren't uh, expecting it, yeah, shit's about to get real. Um, so that was a great element. But they go back and you have Walt going to these neo-Nazis under the guise that he has some new formula that he wants to get back into the business with them. And you know that there's something else going on because of what he's been doing with this machine gun. You don't exactly know what it is. Goes inside, basically lets them search him. He has nothing but the little the clicker with his keys. And... He is assuming that they're working with Jesse because blue meth is still out there. In a previous scene, whenever he confronted Lydia and found out that it's still out, you know, blue meth is still doing good. And uh, he confronts them about that, saying that I paid you to kill him, you're working with him. And then whenever they bring Jesse in and he gets to see the reality of what he has condemned Jesse to, and there's no words between them, he just looks at him and sees him. And Jesse's like, He's almost like a beaten dog. Like, have you ever seen a dog that got abused? Like, the way that he's kind of like looking at Walt and kind of can't keep a straight look at him. And it's just silence between these two characters. And it's just like, you feel all of the realization of Walt. As if he wasn't already ready to give his life to kind of wrap up whatever little bit he can wrap up and, and right whatever little bit of wrong that he has put out there. When he sees Jesse, you just feel it in the air. All of this anguish that he has looking at for all intents and purposes, his like adoptive son in a certain way and what he has brought to his life. And whenever he tackles him and hits that clicker, <laughs> you 
God damn, that shit is badass. Like again, the science solution shit I love. Walter White being a badass and coming up with this cool shit I love, but this is might be the icing on the cake and the cherry on top whenever you have this machine gun just pop out of the trunk and go on this rail and just take out all of them over and over again and you realize that is what all of this has been leading to. It is fucking awesome. And as if all of the emotion of this final three episodes wasn't enough, one last badass fuck yeah Walter White moment, that makes this one of the most perfect finales that you've ever seen to where he kills every single person except for Todd because that bitch is Jesse's. Jesse gets to snuff the life out of that psychotic prick. Mr. White. And you get this final little resolve between Walt and Jesse, which is just some of the best payoff for their relationship that you could write to where Walt gives Jesse the opportunity to put the last bullet in him and Jesse finally says no. I'm not doing what you want anymore and throws it back at him and says do it yourself. Walks away and you get this one last look of acknowledgement between these two characters where despite all of the pain that Walt has caused him and all of the hate that Jesse has for Walt, there's like this moment of acknowledgement to where he knows that Walt's gonna die because he sees his injury. And it's almost like he acknowledges the good with the bad and just kind of accepts what has happened and accepts who he is and gives that last little look of it's been real and leaves in the El Camino, which we'll find out what happens with that. And Walt gets to die with his, his his ultimate victory as far as like his pride, his, his empire. He gets to hold the, the cold steel of the, the, the vats that he cooks meth in and just falls to his death. And the way that they have the song Baby Blue playing and the way that they recreate that shot from Crawl Space, I don't know why the hell I couldn't think of the name of it, but they recreate that shot from Crawl Space whenever he's laying down. It's the same exact position, only when Crawl Space it was like this look of fear um, in this, in the finale, it's this subtle look of satisfaction. This little, not really a smile, not really a smirk, but this look of, I did it. I died, but I righted whatever wrong that I could right in the world. And it's a slow zoom up when you see the cops storm this place and Jesse kicks through on the El Camino, um, laughing hysterically and just kind of crying at the same time that it's all finally over. My God, what a finale. What a final season. Uh, so many things were good about this. Like, I, I talked specifically just kind of recapping the story because it just, I feel like there's no way to talk about the season without doing that. But just so many things wrapped up in a perfect way with each of these characters. There's not a stone that felt left unturned. Even the Jesse thing. Like, we have El Camino. But when I watched this finale, for years, I said, Stone Cold. Do not follow this up with anything. Like, as much as I love Vince Gilligan and I have all the trust in the world in him, I was firm in that opinion, like, this is perfect. Please do not come back with another season or a reunion season or a, a movie or anything like that. This is perfect. I can make up my own mind where Jesse went, everything else wrapped up perfectly, and his relationship with Walt is the, all the wrap-up that I need with Jesse. And then the whore that I am, as soon as they announced El Camino, I was like, yes, I want it now. So the fact that we have this movie is great, but even if El Camino never came, even if whatever happens in this movie, which I have yet to watch, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm filming this right now for you guys when I could be watching El Camino. Don't ever say I didn't do anything for you. But this could have been it. This could have been the end to all of it, and it would have been perfect satisfaction. And just the biggest praise that I can give to this season is that. that they were able to write and craft an ending to this series end it on a high note, not draw it out for nine or ten seasons until it sucks, but end it on their own terms whenever they wanted to, the way that they wanted to, and do it so damn good. Thank you, Vince Gilligan, because I said it in season four, season four might be my favorite season of all time, but it only competes with this season. And I, depending on what day of the week and what time of day it is, I'll either say the final season or I'll say season four because this is absolute perfection on television. So all in all guys, Breaking Bad, the final season is 
fantastic. Not a single thing about it that I would change. Yes, maybe it's a little bit small amount of rush to get to the amount of villainy that we need from Walter White in the first couple of episodes, but it feels necessary and it does feel earned. Everything else about this season is flawless. Like everything that they do in the writing room, everything that they do wrapping up these characters, so many great impactful scenes, that episode Ozymandias, even the two episodes that follow it as the epilogue, the kick-ass episode from the first se or the first half of this season with Dead Freight, and then that gripping-ass episode of Say My Name where you finally get this swan song of Mike and this, this really cool acknowledgement of how badass Walter White thinks that he is. So many things about this season I think are just phenomenal. So, like all of the other seasons of this phenomenal show, Breaking Bad Season 5 is perfection. Season 5 of Breaking Bad is an absolute must-watch finale. If you're a fan of this show at any point, it is a must-watch experience, and it is a must-own experience. So go out and buy it. So what do you guys think of the final season of Breaking Bad? Did it answer all of your questions? Did it satisfy every curiosity? Did it wrap up every single storyline in a way that you wanted? Did you have some disappointments with this season? Do you want to see this movie El Camino? Do you feel like it's a little bit superfluous and it should end right here? What's your favorite episode, your favorite moment, your favorite character this season? Let's talk the final season of Breaking Bad down below and then we'll all go watch El Camino. Even though I'm sure a lot of you fuckers have already seen it. Please comment down below. Let me know what you think of this show and this awesome season finale that it gets, or series finale rather, that it gets. And we will talk about it. Please like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button if you are not already a subscriber. If you guys want to check out some social media links, check down below in the video description for social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Also, my Patreon page, which is a great way to give back to this channel. Help this channel grow and get cool exclusive content for your eyes only if you decide to become a patron. Right below that is my Teespring store for all of my merchandise, all of my designs designed by my buddy Woody Bowen. I've got this right here, the new 31 on 31 design. This is one of three, so get this shit right here and represent 31 on 31 leading up to Halloween this year. Send me some pictures if you guys do get this design. Also have all top stream down there, so check that out please. And if you guys want to check out some more of my videos, including all of my previous Breaking Bad season reviews, you can check those out by clicking right over there.